So much of your work has been about helping people blossom to their fullest potential, to live a full-fledged life. I remember visiting your amazing Asia School, which reflects many of the values that Sir Ken has described. And I'm wondering if you can tell us, in your view, what makes for a perfect school? And how does uh, Isha or any of your schools address the natural longing in a human being to know? I'm glad that there's no perfect school mm -hmm. anywhere. Because this aspiration for perfection is very death-oriented. It's something that most people have missed. The nature of life is… Uh, it's never perfect. Only death is perfect. Never has death happened imperf imperfectly. Never has life happened perfectly. If school is about life, then there is no perfect school. Having said that, as someone said, not him, somebody <laughs> uh, from from Sorry, England. Yeah. No, I'm I'm seeing I'm seeing him as a representation of England. <laughs> someone said uh, that education is a necessary evil. It is a necessary evil because uh, there is a resident evil in the in the world. We have very convoluted aspirations in the sense largely most part of the education is trying to manufacture cogs for the larger machine that we have built. Our children are the fuel, unfortunately. We have to put them into some slot where they'll function well. And when we see the world, world is no more about people. The world is about the economic engine that we are driving, it's become bigger than us. We have to keep the engine going, we are scared to stop it for a moment. We have to keep going. Now, the problem is this, that we have created a world, if uh, our economies fail, we will be depressed. If our economies succeed, we'll be damned for good. I feel it's better you're depressed <laughs> Now, talking about a school as a way of manufacturing cogs for the machine, there are many ways to do it, every nation has its own system. If I have to shape you into a particular shape that you must fit into a particular machine, it's a cruel process. But now we can't let the machine fail, it needs spare parts. Constantly it has to absorb and humanity is the spare parts. So our children are the fuel and the machine parts which go into this to run the larger machine, that's one aspect. So this is why I have addressed education in three different dimensions, which people around me are still trying to grasp why these three different things. There is one form of education which is called Isha Vidya, I think they might have showed something about that. This is for the rural masses in India, where the problem is they are in an economic and social pit which they cannot get out by themselves. The only ladder for them is education, employment generating education. <laughs> but there are reasonably well-to-do people where they might have gone through that in the previous generation, but this generation need not think about how to earn my living. They have to look at how to expand who they are. So we have Isha Home School, which caters to that this, because this kind of education costs money. So, only people who can afford it can do that. Cost money means not like how it costs here. By Indian standards, it costs money <laughs> And there's another form of education where people are not interested in serving this machine or that machine, they want individuals to blossom. So, we have Isha Samskriti, where there is no academic education of any kind. They only learn music, dance, art, Sanskrit language, Kalari, which is a very… the mother of all martial arts and uh, classical dance, classical music, yoga, English language is a passport to the world. So these children are a treat to watch. This is how children should have been. 
Just to give you a glimpse of what it is, at the age of fifteen, for three years they go into monastic life. Compulsorily they must go on, compulsorily they must come out at eighteen, they cannot continue. They'll take a monastic life for three years, but after three years they cannot continue, they have to discontinue that and get back to normal life. This is for discipline and focus, so I was to initiate these fifteen-year-olds and, uh, you know, these sixty days they are going through, from morning three-thirty to nine in the evening, they are going through almost eight hours of meditation, varieties of sadhana, completely silent for sixty days, fifteen-year-old kids, totally silent. So I want to… just another five days left for the initiation, I want to see how they are and I go there at three-thirty in the morning to see them. All these kids are just sitting like this, unmoving. I… I just looked at them and they were literally glowing. I sat there and wept because I have never seen children like this in my life. Definitely I was not like this when I was fifteen. I was nowhere near what they are today. But you can't make the entire world like that. This is uh, an ideal. <laughs> to work towards. The idea of this kind of schooling is just to develop human body and human brain without any intention, without any intention as to what they should become. They can become whatever they want. Only thing is, human body and human mind should grow to its fullest capability and attention is the main thing. An indiscriminate and unprejudiced attention is what we're trying to evolve in the children, that they learn to pay attention to everything the same way, that you don't divide the world as something as good and something as bad, something high, something low, something divine, something devil, something filthy, something sacred. No, you learn to pay the same attention to everything. This is the fundamental of this form of education. What will they do? What will they do is the aspiration. So I guaranteed them one thing, twelve years, if you enter the school, the commitment is for twelve years. You have to, six if you come, eighteen if you… you can leave. So they asked me, what will the children do? I said, one thing I'll assure you, we will not give you a certificate in the end. They said, Sadhguru, what? I said, uh, did anybody ask me, what is my certification? Only in the American embassy they asked me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when I… <laughs> almost, what, twenty years ago or eighteen years ago, when I went to apply for the visa to come to United States, the consul general wanted to meet me, she was a lady. I went to meet her and she said, yes, I know what you've done and all this, but do you have a yoga certification <laughs> because in America you will need this? I said, if I had asked for a certification from my guru, he would have killed me, so I don't have <laughs> So I said, no certification because doors in the world may open little slowly for you, but when they open, they stay open because not because of qualification, but by competence you open doors.